Hello and a very warm welcome to all of you. Though a little late, but firstly, I'd like to wish you all a very, very wonderful new year ahead. I am Deepthi and I will be the presenter for today's webinar on 2020, what's in store for the textile and apparel industry. I look after the market intelligence vertical at Fiber Fashion Private Limited. We have over 20 years of marked experience in serving the textile and clothing industry across the globe. So let's see what we'll be covering in today's webinar. First of all, I'll just provide a brief summary of the major events that happened in 2019-19 that turned the uh, scenario change in terms of sourcing for the textile and clothing industry. We will briefly move on to the US-China trade wars impact on the global supply chain, Brexit that finally happened on 31st of January, WTO and the tariff preferences and how the world again is getting back to a quota system where there are no more quotas, but tariff will become another limitations in the type of trading or in the type of export that happens between developed and developing economies. Moving on, let's have an idea on the estimates of global economic and business scenario, how the various economies are expected to grow. And finally, how 2020 would be for us. Now, if we consider 2019, of course, it was one of the significant years in textile and clothing industry for the fact that global growth weakened during 2019. And there were certain major changes that occurred because of the factors that occurred in 2019, like China overtook US as the largest fashion market. This was one of the breakthrough years for secondhand clothing, for sustainability being more accepted in the society and size inclusions for higher sizes, garment productions. Another important factor, if you consider for 2019 was the impact on profitability of world's largest retailers because of uncertainty, because of consumption slowdown, because of e-commerce boom and other elements that impacted the baseline for these major brands and retailers. Industry thankfully has started to move in the direction from fast fashion to flexible or more sustainable fashion. Global companies who have purpose, purposely changed their sourcing mix uh, from being very, very reliant on China as a sourcing market to expanding to other Asian, Latin American and African economies to source from. And of course, the margins were under great pressure, largely owing to tariffs, sustainability and process improvements. Now, if we look at the entire scenario that happened last year, everybody had two major uh, findings out of the entire scenario that Vietnam and Bangladesh now seem to be the higher apparent to China's dynasty. Moving on to the US-China trade war, something that everyone followed the entire year and then they thought that how this is going to impact their businesses. Well, US and China had spent 2019 majorly lobbying tariffs at each other instead of embracing the trade that could have boosted the business on both sides. American fashion brands specifically who were affected have moved their sourcing orders out of China to countries like Vietnam, Cambodia, Myanmar, Bangladesh, some parts of Latin America. And the entire landscape of apparel sourcing changed. Even in Europe, which was not having a trade war uh, with China as such, saw a notable decline in its market share. Now, another interesting factor was that China increasingly saw moving their factories to countries, Asian countries like Vietnam, to become a leading textile supplier from just another expo, expo, a barrel exporting country in Asia. And this now looks like a major permanent transition. If we see the overall effects on global textile and apparel trade, of course, the economic growth slowed because of the trade war. 
it hurt the European economy, particularly Germany, even though the relations between Germany and China and Germany and US still remain good. US, Britain, Germany, Japan, South Korea all showed significant slowdown in manufacturing performance. Asian governments kind of stimulated their economies to overcome the damage from the trade war, gave an opportunity to other Asian economies to have increased their market shares in the US market. Some of the major African nations also witnessed certain significant slow growth in terms of production volume, volume gains. And one interesting trend was that entire movement of, of China's outsourcing that was happening to the other Asian economies were for low-end clothing. And high-end high -end goods still continued to be made in China. American manufacturers were reducing their capital investments and delaying hiring due to uncertainty caused by the trade war. Of course, the effects on brands and retailers that has impacted in the last six months would be would continue uh, this year also because of the coronavirus status, which I will take up at the end of this seminar. Another important factor was that both the service of consumer sentiment and business confidence had shown sharp declines across the globe. This was primarily because of the uncertainty and the anxiety that people had for the upcoming year 2020. Now, one important factor that the entire industry was kind of speculating was Brexit's impact on Asia. Now, firstly, we've also had a lot of, lot of clients coming in and asking whether GSP would continue. Yes, indeed, GSP would continue. UK government has assured that amidst Brexit, GSP would continue to be provided to all those beneficiary countries that had signed, uh, that had the GSP plus preferences with EU. Having said that, it will only be during the transition period that ends on 31st December 2020. The highest impact is expected to be on Bangladesh because a lot of investment from UK might be hit into Bangladesh and this could adversely affect Bangladesh in terms of local procurement. The third would be uh, the impact on India, where there are concerns that there will be consequences on Indian business firms operating in the UK and that revenues may be hit if there is weakening of the pound sterling. However, we believe that it, if India, India can benefit from Brexit in case the in EU India FTA talks resume that have been stalled since 2013. Now, we would like to understand what are the kind of steps that have been taken by UK to make sure that the impact of UK opting out of EU should be minimal for all its trade relations. Now, from the date of Brexit up till December 30th, 31st, 2020, both the countries involved have agreed that no major changes will take place to allow the businesses to adjust themselves. And this transition period will also allow exporters to learn the processes and protocols accordingly. Imposition of tariffs by the EU on the United Kingdom could also create new opportunities. Now, countries which have uh, diversified exports are more likely to benefit out of this arrangement. And UK, after all, has, trying, has been trying to replicate all of EU's trade deals. So whatever countries EU has a trade agreement with, the UK has been trying its best to sign off those trade agreements again with these countries. And till now, because UK was a part of EU, it could not sign and negotiate deals with other countries that have not, not uh, that have no deals with EU. But now UK can also sign an agreement with countries like the US. Moving on to the WTO and tariff preferences. I must say 2019 was a very, very confusing, very, very irritating year in terms of tariffs being imposed and then taken aback, especially between China and US and the entire trade war happening around that. Now policymakers 
are developing new regulations to address some emerging areas in international trade, such as e-commerce, labor standards, environmental protection, regarding protection regarding sanitary and phytosanitary measures. However, they need to understand that policy missteps would further enfeeble an already weak global economy. Instead, if we are looking at multilateral cooperation and national level policies, those will be the ones that could provide timely support to the economies of all countries. Now, basically what we are looking at is now tariffs are more coming into picture, more like trade policies moving from measures at the border to measures behind the borders. Trade tensions and Brexit would continue in 2020 also to create significant uncertainty and having quite a quantifiable impact on growth of various economies. And tariffs as such in specific will remain again an unpredictable weapon for trade disruption. We don't know how and when what kind of trade wars intensify this year. We just hope they do not come as black swans like the coronavirus to impact the industry on a very, very large scale. What we expect out of WTO is also to get involved into closer cross-border cooperation on multiple fronts. Countries should actually address grievances with the rule-based trading system, promptly resolve the world resolution of a plate body, and settle disagreements without raising tariffs and non-tariff barriers. Because ultimately, raising tariffs and non-tariff barriers would be limiting trade. Where, wherein once we are talking about the entire free trade area that we want to propose to the global economy as a whole, and we are again getting back to the quota system of restrictive trade practices between regions, between countries. Now, when we look at the global economic and business scenario, global growth weakened considerably in 2019, mainly due to the trade war and weakening growth in China. And accordingly, many central banks began to lose, loosen their monetary policy. However, as global exporters adjusted to the new world of higher tariffs, the impact of trade war on real GDP growth turned out to be smaller than what was expected. Because market sentiment was boosted by tentative signs that manufacturing activity and global trade are bottoming out, a broad-based shift towards accommodative monetary policy came in, Across advanced economies, the growth that has been projected is expected to stabilize at 1.6%. For the emerging markets and the developing economy group, growth is expected to increase to 4.4% in 2020 and 4.6% in 2021. The factors for concern are that rising geopolitical tensions, notably between the United States and Iran, could actually disrupt global oil supply and weaken the tentative business investments. Moreover, intensifying social unrest across many countries, including Hong Kong, and the erosion of trust in established institutions is actually dragging growth lower than projected. If I look at region-wise forecast for growth for this year, East Asia and Pacific is expected to grow at 5.7% because regional growth, excluding China, is projected to slightly, re slightly recover uh, owing to domestic demand benefits from final financial conditions and robust capital flows. In Europe and Central Asia, growth is projected to be around 2.6% because of stabilization of key commodity prices and Euro area growth and recovery of Turkey as a market. Latin America and Caribbean is expected to grow at a rate of 1.8. In Brazil, of course, there is more robust investor confidence. When I talk about Middle East and North Africa, expected growth shall be around 2.4%. Iran's economy is expected to stabilize after a contractionary year as the impact of US sanction tapers and oil production and exports, which are expected to stabilize. In terms of South Asia, we are seeing one of the highest growth next to East Asia and Pacific, that would be of 5.5%, basically because of modest rebound in domestic demand and economic activity, benefits from policy accommodation in India and Sri Lanka, 
and increased business confidence and support from infrastructure investments in Afghanistan, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. If I talk about Sub-Saharan Africa, expected growth is around 2.9%. Uh, investor confidence improves in some large economies, energy bottlenecks ease, and macroeconomic stability would improve the business environment and bolster private investment. So if I want to summarize for 2020, what is likely if I talk about the global scenario, the U.S. economy will expand based on estimates about sustainable growth in the labor force and productivity. Europe will stabilize. Uh, since the Eurozone growth in 2019 was alarming, with some large economies, notably Germany and Italy, coming very close to recession, with the conclusion of Brexit, it is expected that the uncertainty will be reduced and Europe will stabilize. China's growth rate will fall below 6% for the first time since 1990. Apart from, of course, the US-China trade war, which is very tempting to blame too, the decade-long deceleration is actually due to both structural and cyclical factors like an aging population and a sharp drop-off in the productivity growth. When I talk about limited growth in emerging markets, it is because all the markets in textiles and garments which will be getting China's share are not actually equipped and ready to face that kind of volume and potential. Whether we talk about Bangladesh or India or Vietnam or Pakistan, each of these countries has their own limitations. Coming down to in commodity prices will also trend down based on inventories and other factors the dollar is likely to appreciate as the u.s economy has been growing faster than other developed economies and the interest rate differentials between united states on one hand and europe and japan on the other favored a dollar dominated denominated assets so we expect the u.s dollar to climb another three percent over the next two years before beginning a long and a long and gentle retreat Another, uh, another factor that a lot of clients, a lot of people that I spoke to in the industry uh, have doubts about is whether we expect a recession in 2020. Well, I would like to say that it is unlikely because the risk facing the global economy remain daunting. However, we believe the US-China trade wars uh, impact has been contained. The new threat is now the coronavirus, which has already impacted the supply chains in textile and clothing. But still, it won't be that bad that it would actually lead to recession in global economies. If we talk about the overall impact on 2020 for textile and apparel, if I want to sum up, of course, 2020 is very, very anxious, nervous, and uncertain. These are the three words that I can theme to summarize 2020 for textiles and clothing industry. Fashion stakeholders are actually not looking up to 2020. Pessimism is evident everywhere. External shocks are expected to continue both in regional and global levels, whether it is for FTAs or it is regarding climate change factors. Industry growth is estimated to be somewhere between 2.5 to 3%. The only change makers could be digitization, automation, R&D, and innovation. Sustainability, which has been the talk of the town for the last five years or so now, would also continue to grow and at a higher pace, owing to the younger generation favoring the use of sustainable clothing. China will still continue to present a lucrative opportunity for fashion players. But of course, it is not one country now where you can put all your eggs in one basket. So brands and retailers need to diversify their sourcing plans, as I also mentioned in my earlier webinars. Markets like India, Southeast Asia, Middle East, and Russia are going to offer huge potential if, they, if their economies are backed up by good government and business-supported policies and demand will grow more for purpose-driven companies. 
So whether it is regarding sustainability or some other, demand will grow for those brands and retailers. Most important, the coronavirus impact, which I have termed as the black swan for 2020 that we have had. All of us would agree that the high degree of integration that the Chinese economy has in the global supply chain means that this epidemic is likely to have a very, very broad impact outside the country. Textile sector in particularly, which is exposed to about 19% of value added being dependent on China is definitely going to have a very, very significant impact because of the coronavirus. Now, what graph here I've presented is basically the share of Chinese value added in global final demand by sector versus inventories compared to long term average by sector in number of days. So we see that the dependency of textiles and apparels on China as a market is very, very high. And I think we've already surpassed the inventory days time. In terms of its serious impact, if I want to sum up, supply chain has already been disrupted between China and other Asian countries, primarily Bangladesh, which has suffered the highest setback. Movement of business representatives to and from China has been put on hold, which has kind of extended proposed business contracts and their execution, which of course is going to be a very, very difference maker in the various strategies brands and retailers follow. Some Chinese factory have already been closed due to the virus issue. Shipments delay of a minimum or four minimum of four weeks has already been announced has already been accepted, even if China opens on 10th of Feb, as announced by the Chinese government. There's already a 20 plus days backlog in China owing to the extended New Year holiday. And even if China returns to work after the 10th, all the pending details that are to be covered for shipments, whether it is logistics, whether it is banking formalities, would take up another week or two. So again, you have a one month backlog in all your production and order cycles. Sales of big retailers are falling due to close down of mainland China stores, which will again impact the backward supply chain. So when we say Nike, which yesterday told that some of their stores, they are planning to close in China. So of course their sales would go down, but all the back in production that was lined up in terms of sales forecast would also go down, which would mean less of fabric, less of yarn, less of fiber. Bangladesh, as I mentioned, will suffer most due to its high dependency for raw materials and machinery from China, which is close to about 50% and 40% respectively. However, India, Pakistan, Indonesia can benefit due to increased requests for raw materials backup. The only positive that I see in Asia for here uh, is that few exhibitions, trade fairs and conferences might be shifted out of China to other Asian countries and present lucrative, lucrative opportunities for business development. Now, if, if I talk about the entire thing, of course, coronavirus has been one of the significant bad news that we have had since the starting of the year and its impact has started to show not only on brands and retailers, but also on manufacturers, on logistics service, on banking services. So I would say that 2020 has started with a state of high anxiety and uncertainty. Industry is already experiencing the slowdown in growth due to the coronavirus impact on the global supply chain. In addition to that, there are apprehensions on the possible impact of tariffs and trade disputes. And facing these interlinked hurdles means that this year is going to be a tough one for the industry. More external shocks are expected to continue, but in what form it is difficult to predict. So 2020 is not expected to be a smooth year. It will be significantly more challenging for some companies than for others. And maybe for a few fortunate, there will also be opportunities to capture. That would be all for today's webinar. Thank you so much for your time. I'm available for your question session now. Have a lovely day ahead.